wisdom, Father, that the Lord's Day is the first day of the week that we can come together and, and Father, to gather around your word, to gather together in fellowship, God, to lift our, our voices in song as we praise you and as we worship you. And, and Father, just to begin our week in your presence corporately, God, what a blessing, what a privilege. Father, we, we ask for the many on our prayer list, God, there are so many that are in need of a healing touch. And, and Father, even those within this building today, God, that need a touch, God, those that have doctor's appointments, dentist appointments, some waiting test results, some that have just had surgery. God, we lift all of these to you this morning. Father, you see each need. God, they're not just names on a prayer list to you, but, but God, you know the very hairs of your head and the numbers. And, and, and God, you, you've told us that we even see the smallest insignificant bird falls from the sky. So God, Jesus reminded us that if you care that much about about the nature and the animals, about how much more that you care for us and, and our loved ones and, and our friends and neighbors. And, and so, God, as we lift those names to you, we just ask that you come on the scene. And, and Father, that you just speak the word. God, we pray that you, we, we're, we're thankful for our doctors and nurses and hospitals. And, and God, we just pray that you would work through them. And, and God, just have your will as you speak and as you touch in the lives of these that stand in, in need today. God, the, the ones in our community that are we lift those families. God, we pray that you would just, uh, again, just, God, speak peace uh, as only you can in, 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 in during these difficult times. And, and Father, we ask for our time together today here. And God, we ask that uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit in everything that's said and done. Father, as we turn our thoughts towards you, as we turn our thoughts towards our relationship with you, just let the anointing of the Holy Spirit just speak to us today. Let the word... Uh, and, and the message just challenge us today, God, that we would be more Christ-like, that we would be more obedient to your word, to your will, and to your way. God, again, we pray for our country. We pray for the many, many that are affected by this virus. God, we pray for all of those that are caught in, in, in the riots, and God, all of the political leaders. And, and Father, you tell us in your word to, to lift those up. And God, we come to you today asking you. And God, we just pray that you would just be with those that, that know you as Savior, especially in leadership. And, and God, just bless them, give them wisdom and, and strength and courage. And, and Father, those that don't know you, God, we ask that the Holy Spirit would just convict. And God, we pray for their salvation. God, we ask that you, again, let this be one nation under God. God, a nation that, uh, that we've seen your hand blessed in so many ways. And God, we ask for the continued blessings. But we know... We know that our country is in need of, of a real revival, real repentance. And, and God, we just pray that as the church, God, that you would have us doing our part. And God, as we look into that part of the word today, again, that word, that instruction would challenge us today. That, Father, we would, we would be determined that we're going to be in your will, doing your bidding as you call us to do. God, we love you. We thank you. We commit this service into your hands. It's in the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And God, we ask all of these things in faith believing. And God, everyone in the house says, Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I just want to remind you by way of announcement, uh, next Sunday night, next Sunday night, that's August the 9th, the, the day before school starts, next Sunday night, the churches of our association are going to be meeting at the various schools in Livingston County. And North Livingston, along with Salem Baptist, will be meeting at North Elementary and North Middle School campus. Uh, and, and remember, when we do this, we're going to meet at 7 o'clock. Uh, it's going to be just like an outdoor church service, out, not, not a church service, but a, a, a time of prayer. Uh, we're just going to have a couple of scriptures and then prayer for our, our schools, for the students, the families, the staff, the administration. And so we encourage all of you to be there for that. Uh, again, because it is a function of the church and because we want to be a good uh, uh, corporate neighbor, church neighbor in our community. Uh, we're going to do everything we're supposed to with the social distancing, the masks, all of that. Uh, but make your plans next Sunday night, 7 o'clock, to be a part of that. Also, uh, you probably know this on, on the prayer list because we can't give that out by hand, but if you're updating your prayer list, uh, be sure that you put Brother Chris's mother, Bonnie Rose, on your prayer list. Uh, she had her foot uh, below the knee amputated this week. So remember Bonnie. I continue to pray for her and the family as she recovers and, 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 and all that's the, the rehab in front of her. And then Brother Albert this week had an ablation on his heart. 
uh, I understand he had four different uh, ablations to the heart that got him off of one of the medications that's been being very difficult on him. But uh, just remember him and Kathy in your prayers. Continue to pray for them. Pray for his strength. Uh, of course, this was a, a, a very serious surgery. Uh, he is home now, but uh, continue to live in love and especially pray for, for those two along with the rest that's on our list. All right? Brother Joe, come to lead us in time of worship for them. It's good to see each and every one of you this morning. This is saying uh, victory in Jesus. Mm -hmm. 
two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in the midst of us. God, we know that you're here this morning. Father, we invite you here. Father, we just ask you, Lord, to put your arms around us today. Protect us. Build the heads around this place, Lord. Protect each and every family here, Lord. Because, Lord, we do know, Lord, that we do battle with spiritual warfare. God, help us to crucify the flesh, Lord. Become more of the Spirit. Make the Spirit man strong. Help me, Father, to do that. Father, we just pray for Brother Danny, Lord, as he comes before us. Pray, Lord, that your anointing, Lord, would be upon him. Lord, we thank you for the word, Lord, that you've been giving him, Lord, to speak to us. God, may it not fall on deaf ears, Lord, but to fall on ears, Lord, that are attentive. And they'll listen, and they will put it into action. Help us to do that, Lord. Pray for a country. Pray for a leadership. Pray, God, that you have the right president in there, Lord, that who you want. And God, I pray that that president, Lord, would look to you and pray for a president right now, Lord, that you would touch him, Lord. Give him guidance. And pray, God, that he would seek it from you. Lead God and direct the rest of his service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will, if you'd open your Bibles to the book of 1 Chronicles, the Old Testament book of 1 Chronicles. If you're in your Old Testament, you go about 12 books over from the book of Genesis. I think the 13th book, you'll come to the book of 1 Chronicles. You have the Kings and then the Chronicles. And then we get the accounts there of the leaders of Israel. The people of Israel had prayed and had asked God that they had uh, been being led by the, the judges and they had wanted a king like their neighbors had had. You remember the account there that God uh, wanted them to be ruled by judges. He didn't want them to have the kings as the, the, the heathen world had, but they wanted that. They kept asking for that. Finally, God said, well, I don't, it's not the best for you, but if you keep asking, I'm going to give it to you. And so Saul was anointed by Samuel to be the first king. You'll remember the scripture describes Saul as being head and shoulders above the rest. He, he looked kingly. He, he fit the bill to be what uh, a leader they thought should look like. Uh, when Saul uh, was put into the position of being a king, uh, at, at first he was a, a right king, uh, but then his... Uh, power, I guess you could say, uh, got to him. Uh, he began to uh, turn away from God. He began to seek uh, things of this world as far as his leadership. He began to trust in his own guidance rather than God's. And if you'll remember, uh, even at one point when he was about to go to battle, uh, he had uh, consulted a, uh, a, a psychic, a medium, uh, 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 an occultist. Uh, instead, of, uh, instead of seeking God himself uh, to, to help him to decide how he should wage that battle. And so God had had enough of Saul. Uh, God was going to remove Saul. He was going to take the kingship not only from Saul, but from the whole line of Saul. And you'll remember the account of Samuel was sent to uh, anoint the next king, and he was sent to the house of Jesse. And so he went and he, he met Jesse's sons, and each of the sons were brought in, and Samuel was saying, no, that's not the one. And, and, and God would tell him, no, that's not the one. And finally, all the brothers had been brought in. And, and Samuel asked Jesse, said, this is just not working. Is there not another? And, and Jesse said, well, the youngest, but he's, he's out with the sheep and he's not, he's not what you'd want. But they brought David in. And you'll remember that when he saw David, he knew David was to be the king. And so he, he anointed David to be the king. And, and you remember the account there that Saul was still the king.
Uh, David had the opportunity to serve in the court of Saul, uh, served first as a musician to him and then as a warrior. And, and you'll remember that David and Saul's son, Jonathan, were the best of friends. The Bible says they, they loved one another like brothers. And then um, as the time came that uh, David was to take over and, and David had the opportunity to even take Saul's life, uh, but David said, I'll not touch God's anointed. God will have to do this God's way. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get involved there. That's God's man. And, and God will have to show me how this happens. And, and so all of that took place. And then we come down to, uh, the Chronicles begins to tell how the change takes place. And you remember Daniel tells us, and I believe it's Daniel chapter two, um, that God sets up the kings. God sets up those in authority and God removes the kings. Uh, that same passage, Daniel as a prophet tells uh, that God uh, orders the times, that God changes the times. That's all in God's hands. So as I was thinking in the last few weeks about where we are in America, where the church in America is, and, and thinking about the history of the church throughout the, the church's 2,000 plus year history, how the church has functioned in societies and how civilizations have, have risen to great heights and then when they turn from God, those civilizations go away, those civilizations fall and those civilizations go into to, to captivity, they go into slavery, they go into poverty and, and looking at the situation we are in America and I, I firmly believe that nothing is happening today outside of the purview of God. God sees it all. God knows it. God knows the beginning from the end. Uh, when we sang that song, Victory in Jesus, we talk about the streets of gold. We talk about the mansion that God's gone to prepare, Jesus has gone to prepare for us. And there's a life after this. This is not all there is to it. And so we have to live here. We have to function here. We have to, to operate here, but we've got a hope beyond this. But while we're here, uh, we do have to, to, to live. We have to function and and the old saying goes, I believe there's an old song that goes, there's a whole lot of living between the cross and heaven. And so as we think about that, we think about the church, we think about our relationship with Christ, our relationship with God, and how should we live? How should we function? How should we conduct ourselves when we see turbulent times, when we see chaotic times, when, when we don't know what is about to happen and, and we can know that God does know and so in God, we have our hope. In God, we have our trust. And so as I was thinking of that and, and taken back to this account here in the book of First Chronicles where David is taking over now as king. Saul has, has gone to battle and in his final battle against the Philistines. You'll remember that, that David's uh, time as a warrior, just when he was a young man, uh, was shown in a battle against the Philistines when he uh, went up against Goliath, the, the Philistine's star warrior. And you'll remember that David was just a little fella, uh, just a small stature of a man, uh, no real experience as far as warfare. Saul was the king, the warrior, and, and the battle was against the Philistines, and, and David uh, looked at Saul's army, and none of Saul's warriors were willing to go up against the Philistines. None of them were willing to face down uh, Goliath, this star warrior of the Philistines. And, and David said, well, God's God, and God's the God of Israel, and God's my God. I'll, I'll go again him. And so you'll remember he, he, he just had a slingshot to use. And, and so Saul said, here, you take my armor. And they, they, they put all of that armor on little David. And David had all that on and weighed him down. David said, I can't do this with all of this. And, and so David just took what he had, the slingshot, the stones, and, and, and God on his side. And you'll remember uh, that he slew Goliath. And then he went out and he took Goliath's own sword, cut his head off, and brought that back to Saul. And now time has passed. Saul has turned now against David. Saul has, has sought to kill David. And now Saul is battling the Philistines once again. David is in Hebron. Uh, Saul goes in the battle against the Philistines and in that battle, because as the scripture tells us in 1 Chronicles chapter 10, because Saul had turned his back on God, because Saul had sought uh, the occult rather than God in, in wisdom for how to, to carry out that battle, uh, Saul was injured. Uh, Saul took a, a, an arrow from one of the, the Philistine archers and it wasn't a fatal arrow, but it was one that Saul knew it was gonna, he, he couldn't go back into the battle. And so as you read there in 1 Chronicles chapter number 10, Saul asks his armor bearer, 
uh, to take his sword and to kill him. And of course, the little armor bearer, you know, probably had never killed anybody and, and not a man of war himself. And he said, I can't do that. And so Saul took his own sword and committed suicide, killed himself. And in that same battle, Jonathan had been killed. And so the armor bearer seeing what happens here, the armor bearer knowing he was responsible for Saul, he commits suicide himself. And you read that tragic account of the end of Saul. And remember with all of that, David has been anointed. The, the, the tribes of Israel had been divided up. You'll remember when they got into the promised land, how they had all divided into the tribes. And, and as the prophet had said in, in Daniel, that God sets the kings in authority. And so David knows now that Saul has died and, and the way the Philistines had, had conducted all of that, it was just horrific the way that all plays out there in, in 1 Chronicles chapters 10, 11. And, and now you come to chapters 12 and you read chapter 12 of 1 Chronicles and it's time for David to be installed as the king. And all of the tribes of Israel now, they've, they've had divided loyalties. They, they were some of the tribes that were committed to Saul, some that were gonna be committed to David. But as you look there in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, all of the tribes come together. They unify and they all come to David in Hebron and they all have their, their different talents, their different abilities. It tells us that some of them were, were archers that they could shoot the bow with their left hand or the right hand. There were some that were, were very proficient even with a slingshot like young David had been. There were others that were proficient with the sword. And so we go through each of these tribes as they come to Hebron, as they present themselves to David, that they're going to support David. They're going to see that David is now installed as the king and they're gonna present a unified front. The, the nation of Israel is going to show under God's leadership that they're behind David, that they're gonna be a, a one united nation. But there's one particular group, one of the tribes when they come and there's something in that description of them. I love how God often in the scriptures, he'll give a whole list of people and then he'll just kind of in parentheses say, but this is something that stands out in my mind about this particular guy or this particular group. And when you get down to chapter uh, 12, verse number 32, you find one instance of that where God says, and by the way, this stands out to me about these people. And if something stands out to God about somebody that he puts it in the scripture, I think it's worthy for us to take note. What is it that, that stood out to God and is that something that we could strive to be like? Is that a characteristic that we could seek to, to be like those people? So looking at, at 1 Chronicles chapter 12, as you stand, as we honor the reading of God's word, we're gonna begin at verse number 23. And it goes from, from 23 on down to about verses, I think 39, but we're gonna stop at 32 as he enumerates each of the tribes and tells what those tribes how many of them come or how many of their leaders come or, or what they were proficient in. But I wanna pause at 32 and I want you to look at what God says about this particular group. And then I wanna look at that for just a moment this morning and see as, as the church in the 21st century, as Christians in America, when we see America at a crossroads and I, I firmly believe we're at a crossroads. I'm, I'm not one that can tell you the future. I don't know how this is gonna play out. God does. But however this turns out, uh, this thing with the virus, the, the virus didn't come from God. All sickness comes from Satan. All sickness comes from hell. But as we said in the last few weeks, everything has to go through God's hands. God knows about it and God can use this. God can turn this. All of the rioting that we're seeing now, and remember what the scriptures tells us, that, that the battles that we face when God's involved and God is certainly involved, they're not physical battles. While, while they man, may manifest themselves in, 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 in physical displays, our battles are spiritual. And the scripture tells us that those spiritual battles, they're waged in high places, heavenly places, and it's good versus evil, God versus Satan, and, and, and we're warriors in that as part of God's army, part of, part of God's children, God's family. So as we look at this, this particular 
display here of Israel, and again, I'm not preaching a, a replacement theology. Israel is still God's chosen, but I believe the American church has a place in biblical prophecy. The American church, God, we're, we're God's people too. And so God has a plan and God has a purpose. And we need to see how we fit into that. And then the, 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 the message this morning, I'm just calling it, how shall we live? We, we've got to know how we respond, how we react, how we conduct ourselves. And so as we begin there in verse number 23, he begins to, to list each of the tribes. And he tells us those tribes come, he tells something about them, but I want you to pay particular attention now when we get to verse 32. First Chronicles chapter 12, David is in Hebron. The, the, the tribes begin to come, their leadership begins to come to install David as the king. And he says in verse number 23, the numbers of the armed troops who came to David at Hebron to turn Saul's kingdom over to him according to the Lord's word were as follows. From the Judites, 6,800 armed troops bearing shields and spears. From the Simeonites, 7,100 brave warriors ready for war. From the Levites, now remember, this is the priestly tribe. This is the ones that, that didn't get an inheritance of the land. They were to be the priests that were to take care of the, the tabernacle, to take care of later the temple. They were the ones to take care of the worship. They, they didn't get an inheritance of land, but everyone else was to take care of them because they were God's spokespeople. From the Levites, 4,600, verse number 27. In addition to Jehoadiah, leader of the house of Aaron, he brought 3,700 men. And Zadok, a young, brave warrior, he brought 22 commanders from his own ancestral house. Now, we assume he had some soldiers under him too, but in this case, they just tell who the commanders were. So, so it's, a, it's a vast number of people that's represented here. Verse number 29, from the Benjamites, the relatives of Saul, 3,000. Now here, God makes a note. Up to this time, the Benjamites, the majority of them had maintained their allegiance to the house of Saul. From the Ephraimites, 20,800 brave warriors who were famous men in their ancestral houses. From half of the tribe of Manasseh, 18,000 designated by name to come and make David king. And then at verse number 32, we talk about the, the followers of Iskar. He calls them the Iskarites. But he says something about these men. And then he goes through the rest of the tribes. And we're not going to read the rest of the tribes, but, but I want you to pay attention to what he said about the men of Iskar. Here's what God noted. They understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. 200 chiefs with all of their relatives under their command. Let's ask God to bless the reading of his word in our time together. Father, we do thank you for, again, this Lord's Day. God, I, I thank you for the scriptures. And God, even though we're, we're talking about the installation of David some 4,000 years ago, God, we're still looking at your people in relationship with you. And God, we're looking at a, a time of, of chaos, a time of change, a time of unknown. And yet, God, all of these people that represents you by their tribes, the people of Israel, God, they're presenting a unified front because they've been instructed that you anointed David to be their next leader. God, may we today look at what you say about these men God, men who understood the times, men who understood and knew what Israel needed to do. And God, I'll be the first to admit our times are confusing. Our times are chaotic. And God, we have those that would want to change the very foundations of our nation and that would want to rip you from every public vestige of our nation. But God, we know that America was founded upon your principles, upon your word, 
Our forefathers wanted a place to where that they could freely worship you. And your word was part of the foundation of every law that this country ever conceived and instituted. And God, I don't believe your plans and your purposes have changed even though the people have changed. God, we see what happens when people turn from you when we look at someone like Saul. God, we see a man there that lost his relationship with you. We see the destruction that came upon him and his family. And Father, we see a man like David, a man who was fallible, a man who sinned, a man who wasn't perfect, a man who made many, many mistakes. But God, in him we see a man that still always turned back to you. God, may we be a people that seeks you as David sought you. May we be a people that that even though we may sin, even though we may make mistakes, even though we don't understand all of the times, may we be a people that seeks you, your will, your way, your guidance. And then God, may we be busy impacting, affecting our culture, our community with what your word says and what the church is to be, a light in a sin-darkened world. God, I ask for the anointing of the Holy Spirit today as we look at these scriptures. God, I ask that you would open our hearts and our minds. God, help each of us to determine that we're going to be like these men. Different skill levels, different abilities, different talents, but God, they were willing to come together for your plan, your will, and your way. May we too commit that we're willing to get involved that we're willing to educate ourselves, that we're willing to do it your will, your way, because that's the only way that'll work. While we're here and until you call us home, it's in Jesus' name I pray, I ask the Holy Spirit's guidance and all of God's people said, amen. You may be seated. As I said, if we continued on in chapter number 12 of 1 Chronicles, we would find the next six chapters enumerating the rest of those tribes. But we see there as he stops to talk about those men of Iskar. And the thing that God noted about them, the thing that, that the chronicler noted as he's writing the book of Chronicles, and we assume that's Ezra, as he, as he puts that in there, they understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. And understanding the times, they knew that God had a plan, God had a purpose, and God was carrying that out. And they saw that in the things that were happening in, in the political culture that they were in. They saw that happening in the way that they even worshiped their God. And so as we look at that, we're reminded of America's foundation and, and we look at, as I said, the, the, the chaos and all the confusion and the things that are going on in America today. And, and so as the church, as Christians, as part of God's body, how should we live? What should we do? And so we look back at a time in history when God stops to look at a group of people like this. I was reading an account during World War II and, and, and any time that our country is involved in, in a conflict, in a war like that, as you can imagine, those are, are chaotic times. Those are times when, you know, we have the, the, the advantage of looking back and we know what happened as, as the war ended, but, but at the time it was going on, they didn't know how that was gonna turn out. They didn't know if they were going to be a, a free America when all of that was over. They didn't know if they were going to live under communism, even if, if we were going to, to, to speak a different language because somebody else was gonna take our country over. There were so many forces that were, were wanting to destroy the America that we had. And so it's told during that time that they still lived life, things still went on, they, they still had their ball games, but, but one of the rules they had was during the ball games when they would broadcast the games on the radio, the radio announcers, if there was a break in the action, say it was because of weather, they couldn't say over the radio what was going on for the delay in the game because they thought the enemy may be listening and if they were listening and they would hear that there's some kind of a, a weather situation going on, that could influence if they were to be wanting to attack America or something. And so the story is told that Dizzy Dean was the radio announcer for the St. Louis ball team and, and they were in the middle of a ball game and a rainstorm came. 
And Dizzy Dean is, 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 as the radio announcer, what their job is to do is, is when there's a break in the action, they have to just keep talking and keep people listening. And so Dizzy's talking and, and he keeps talking and it keeps raining and he's just talking about everything and he's, he's trying to enlist the other guys in the booth in the conversation. And, and the story goes that finally he gets to a point, he, he can't say why the action is stopped because that's a rule, you can't tell what the weather is. And so as he's giving the broadcast, he's talked about everything he can think of. He, he's told every antidote, every story he can talk about. And, and finally, the words just fail him. And so Dizzy Dean just says over the air, he says, folks, if you don't know why there's a break in the action, just stick your head out the window. Now, maybe you can tell the weather by sticking your head out the window. But it's a lot harder to, to tell the shifting winds of a culture. It's a lot harder to tell in these confusing times and chaotic times what's going on. Uh, you just can't just stick your head out the window. You know, even Jesus gave an analogy like that. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 16, he was talking to the, the church leaders. He was talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And, and in, in chapter 16 of Matthew, beginning at verse number one, Jesus is talking to them and he says, as, 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 and, and they were trying to confuse him. They were asking questions to trip him up. And, and, and they said, could you just give us a sign from heaven so we know who you are? Just do something, just... Just give us something, a sign, a miraculous sign, and we'll know who you are. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse number two, Jesus said, he said, when the evening comes, you say it will be good weather because the sky is red. You can, you can look at the sky and you can tell what the weather's gonna do. He said, in the morning, in the morning time, you can say today will be stormy because the sky is red and lowering or, or threatening. He says, you know how to read the appearance of the sky, but you cannot read the signs of the time. Now, when Jesus told those church leaders, you, you've got all kinds of earthly wisdom, but you don't know God and God's word enough. You're not in tune with God and the spirit of God enough to tell what's going on in the culture. I think Jesus was probably maybe even thinking back to David's time, thinking back to these men of Iskar. When the scripture says, but their talent, their ability, their gift was that they understood the times. They knew it was a time of change. They knew that God set the kings in authority and God removed kings from authority. They knew that although God never changes, the methods and the means sometimes have to change in order for the nation to survive. And so Jesus is using that illustration. And you think about change. I mean, I, I, I think about me and I don't like change at all. Mark Twain said the only person who likes change is a wet baby. I mean, you know, we just, we're, we're opposed to any type of change. We like things to be consistent and the same and, and day after day and just don't upset the apple cart. But that's not realistic. Realistically, things change. You look at America and America's history and, and our culture and, and, and just by the nature of, of, of progress over the centuries, things, things change. The culture changes. But as God's people, we've got to be in tune to God, God's word, because there's some things we can learn from God that there's some things that just do not change. And then there's other things that do change. We've got to know the difference. We've got to understand when things happen. I remember hearing the story about a reporter that was interviewing a man that had celebrated, it was a hundred and something birthdays he had had. He was over a hundred years old and, and the reporter was asking the, the elderly man, he said, you, you've been through all of these changes in a hundred and something years of life. You've, you've seen so many changes. What do, you, what do you think about all of the changes? And the man said, I hated every one of them. You know, he just didn't like change. And I think we're all like that. But things are going to change. Culture is going to change. Change is a natural part of life. And, and the question is not if things change, but when they change, how do we respond? How do we respond as, as Christians? How do we respond as a church? 
And so we, we look at this group of men that God took note of them because when they saw change coming, they weren't so resistant to it that they just scotched up and said, we're not gonna be a part of this. But when they saw the change coming, they began to look, so how is God involved in this? What is God doing here? What, what may God be saying here in this? And as the history of scripture tells us, we have the advantage of looking back through history and seeing what had happened there that, that, that Saul had gone against God, God's word, God's ways. And because of that, God had removed Saul. And now God is placing David. And you'll remember it says there when the Benjamites came, they had been supporters of Saul and his family. But now even the Benjamites are coming and they're going to support David. All of the tribes are coming and, the, and, and they're exhibiting unity. They're all together in this. And as they're ready to put David in now that God has anointed him, they're gonna coronate him as their king. And when you get down to the end of chapter number 12, you see that there's a, a great celebration, a great feast. And all of the people send provisions as they coronate David as their king. If you look at how he starts that, First Chronicles chapter 12, he says, these are the numbers of the men armed for battle. You see, if there were others that were going to say, we're gonna interfere, we're gonna step in, it's not gonna be David. All of the tribes said, we're willing to fight for this because we know that God has anointed him. We know that this is God's plan. And so they come with their bows, their arrows, their swords, their shields. They come prepared for the battle. If this is God's will, if this is God's plan, if this is thus saith the Lord, we're gonna fight for it. It may mean some civil disobedience. It may mean going against the, the, the popular uh, flow or against the, the ideas of the, the majority or the group. But if it's God's word, if it's thus saith the Lord, and we've got to know that, what does God's word say? You see, the first thing that they did is they knew where God was moving. They knew when God was moving. And so God stops with the men of Iskar and he says there's men in the group that while they're prepared for battle, they understand the times. They're smart. They've educated themselves. They've looked at all of the circumstances. They've studied up on it. They've studied God's word and God's plan. And they've said, this is God's will, and so we're willing to fight for it. And they come prepared for that. Look at what happens there. They're not motivated by fear. They're not, they're not motivated by what was popular at the time. They've seen God moving. They've seen that this was God's will. And so they all together came and, and, and as we read through that chapter number 12, you, you, you add those numbers up and you read later in David's army, there were some 390,000 that we account for right there. Later we're told that there were some 600,000 in David's army. 600,000 that were ready to defend the man that God had anointed to be their king. And they had a unified front as they came. They, they knew where God was moving. They understood the times. And we as God's people, when we look at the things that's happening in our, our culture, our country, our society, when we see things happening that goes against God's word, God's will, God's way, we as the church have to be able to say, this is where we draw the line. This is where we stand for God. This is where we stand for God's word. This is where we stand for God's will and God's way. And if we don't, if we're not willing to do that, then God's people, the church, 
becomes irrelevant. When you read world history, you read of countries, you read of civilizations over and over again to where the, the churches go along with the liberal ideas, the churches go along with the popular ideas. The churches say, well, yes, God says that, but that's not the majority opinion. So, so just in order to, to keep things down, to keep trouble down, just to go along, we, we're gonna go along to get along. And in every situation where that happens, when the state gets more involved in the church than God and the leadership of the church sets back and lets it happen, the churches in those areas become irrelevant. And so as we look at America and America's history today and we look at our culture and the things that are happening in our culture, we have a decision to make. Are we going to be like the tribes of Israel? Are we going to be prepared for the battle? We're gonna dig in and say what God wants the way God wants it. It may require change. We may not be able to do it the way we've always done it. We may have to get involved in things that we would rather not get involved in when we go against the flow. But as I said, when we see these things happening, remember what Paul told the church in Ephesus. And you'll remember we talked about the church in Ephesus last week. You'll remember what that church did. When Jesus began to speak to all of the churches, the church in Ephesus, Paul had told them, you better stand true. You better stay true to God's word and God's will and God's way because if you don't, you're going to become irrelevant. And then when Jesus comes to talk to John in the Revelation, he speaks to that particular church, that church that Paul had said, your battles are not flesh and blood, but your battles are with principalities, with powers, with rulers in high places because you're involved in a spiritual battle. And the Ephesians just began to go along with the flow. They began to go along to get along. And by the time John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, Jesus came, the resurrected Jesus, and he said to the church in Ephesus, you've lost, you've forgotten what it's all about. You, you, you've given up and your candlestick is gonna be removed. And you go to that part of the world today and the church in Ephesus not only is not just irrelevant, it doesn't exist. They went away because they didn't stay true to God. And so as we look at passages in the scripture, what does this say to us? What is God telling us today in the church? And we see the times changing. And as I said, we look at the context, we see that God was ahead of those changes. God was the one removing Saul. God was the one putting David in. And God's people had a decision to make. And the men of Iskar understood that. They understood the times. They knew that change was coming. They knew what the prophet Daniel said. God changes times and seasons. And God puts kings in authority and God removes kings from authority. God puts men in leadership and God takes men out of leadership. And so we as the church, we have to look at our culture. We have to look at everything that's happening. We have to be involved, getting ourselves educated and understanding what's happening. And where does that fit into God's timeline? Where does that fit into God's word? Where does that fit into God's big picture? And God's big picture, don't ever lose sight of the big picture. This is all just temporary. This is all going to burn up. This is all going to go away anyway. And if we experience victory in Jesus, it's gonna be because we've prepared not for here, but we've prepared for what comes after this. But you see, while we're here, the living between the cross and heaven, we're either serving one of two masters. And in that, as we're serving God, we're working not that we work for our salvation, but we're, we're working for the betterment of all of those around us in our circle of influence. 
And ultimately that everyone in our circle of influence that we have an influence on, that we take them to heaven with us. And so it's important that we understand God's will, God's word, God's ways. As you look at Psalms 137, you find where, again, the psalmist talking about Israel, a time when Israel had been disobedient and Israel was carried away captive. And as you look at Psalms 137, you find a time where, where the children of Israel, although they had worshiped God, now it just becomes a formality. And they've been carried away captive. Now they're in Babylon. And the psalmist says, while they're in Babylon, Psalm 137, beginning at verse number one, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat. And we wept when we remembered Zion. We, we remembered how it was before when we were free to worship God. When we were in the promised land, we remembered what it was like. And we hung our harps, our lyres on the poplar trees. We just gave up on worshiping God. And our captors asked us for songs. Our, our tormentors asked us to rejoice. They said, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And our response was, how can we sing the Lord's song on foreign soil? How can we worship God in difficult times? And the psalmist goes ahead to say, you better worship God wherever you are. You better worship God while you can. And when you're on foreign soil, you still worship the God of heaven. The children of Israel had been beaten. They had been captured. They, they couldn't get up the, the courage to, 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 to worship God. They, they didn't understand that God was using the Babylonians to bring them back around. And as you look at that, as the psalmist continues with that, if God wouldn't have forced them into Babylonian captivity, the Greek culture wouldn't have expanded if the Greek culture had not expanded that there would be roads and the Romans had not been used by God and in, in, in while it's the devil's plan and, and, and the Romans were oppressing them, God still turned that, that in that climate, in that culture, God was getting things ready that they knew nothing about. They didn't understand what was happening. And they said, how can we worship God here in this circumstance, in this situation? But you see, God was getting ready through the Greeks and God was getting ready through the Romans. God was getting the whole culture ready so that Jesus could come because God had already said he's going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea. He's going to be born of the Virgin Mary and I've got to get her in the right place. I've got to have, have Joseph in the right place. I've got to have the right king in, in, in place. And God was getting everything ready to send Christ. And so all of this had happened and while their disobedience was causing them heartache and hurt, God was still turning that, that he could bless the world by sending the Messiah. And so whatever we go through in life, whatever heartache we go through, whatever difficult trial we go through, just remember God can use that. God can turn that. People are watching our lives. People are watching how we respond to difficulties. People are watching if we're true to what we say we are. And God can use that to lead them to him. And so we have to understand as we see God playing things out, as we see things changing, we understand this is, this is battles going on that we may not, we may not understand they may be above us. Principalities, powers, and high, heavenly places is what the scripture says. And as that's happening, we have to know the word of God. As you see God moving, just like those Iscarites did, you see the change, you see the times, you understand what's happening. There, there's some things we've got to understand. I'll, I'll look, at, look at the difference here. Look at what a precept is. When God tells us in his word, God gives us precepts, God gives us commands. There's some things that, that while times change, culture changes, circumstances change, there's some things that God says that just doesn't change. Those are the precepts of God. Those are the laws of God. The precepts, the truth, the commands, those are things that we obey no matter what our culture does. 
We dig in on those things. We're not going to give up on those things because this is thus saith the Lord. When you look at that, you don't have to ask God if you should commit adultery. You don't have to ask God if you should commit murder. You don't have to ask God if you should lie. I mean, you think of people that, well, now, should I cheat on my taxes or not? After all, the, the government's not doing everything like I think they ought to. Should I cheat just a little? You don't have to ask that question. God says we're to obey the kings and all that are in authority. God says that we're not to lie, we're not to cheat, we're not to steal. Those are precepts. You don't have to ask God about that. A precept is just something you obey because the word of God gives some principles that those precepts are set upon. Now, a, a, a precept is, when we look at the precept, that's, that's, that's the law, that's the command. It doesn't change, but the principles that that's based upon, that's the underlying truth that God gives in his word. And when you look at that, you, you read what Jesus said in the book of Matthew. In, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, don't murder. Verse 27 of chapter 5, he says, you've, you've heard that it was said, don't commit adultery. Verse 33, he says, Again, you've heard that it was said to, to the people long ago, don't break your oath. And he goes through all of this list. Verse 38, you've heard it was said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Verse 43, you've heard it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And he goes on and on with that. And he comes down and talks about the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now remember the law, the precept. There's a principle that that's based upon. Now let me show you where we can go wrong with this. If, if, if you go to Israel today, and you look at the Orthodox Jews. Now they obey God's word. They try to obey it to the to to the, the 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 spirit of the word, to the law, what God says. Now take this, and I, I've shared this with you before. This idea of keeping the Sabbath. If you go to Israel today, and you look at the Orthodox Jews today, they they've taken this idea of of, of the precept, but but they've twisted that so much so that they can make it fit what they want it to say. You look at what they do with the Sabbath. If you go where the Orthodox Jews are today, here's some rules about the Sabbath. There's hundreds of rules they have, but when they miss the principle that that's based upon, look at this. <clears throat> Cooking in all forms on the Sabbath is prohibited. You can't boil, you can't roast, you can't bake, you can't fry. But here's the, the caveat they put in there. Cooking is defined as raising the temperature above 113 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you can cook it and keep it at 112, you're okay. You see what they do? You, you, if you leave the hot water tap on, you can't turn it off with your hand. That's work but it's okay to hit the spigot with the back of your hand. That's not work. So there's a way around it. Now, if you've left the gas on, because that's dangerous, you can turn the gas off, but not with your fingers, not the normal way. It's the same as the water tap. You have to, to hit it with your elbow or hit it with the back of your hand. You see the rule? Keep the Sabbath, but ways that you can get around it. The, the, the preparation of food, they say it's, it's greatly affected on the Sabbath. Here's a rule. You can't squeeze lemon into a glass of iced tea because that would be work. But because you can have fish on the Sabbath, you can squeeze lemon on the fish. This is Orthodox Jews. You can't light a fire on the Sabbath according to the law. The strict Judaism views prohibit turning electric lights on because that's the same as building a fire. But they've come up with a way to solve the problem. You just install timers in your house. And the timers are set so the lights will come on by themselves. And so now you can have the light, the essence of building the fire, because the timer's turning it on. You're not turning it on and off. Another thing they do to solve a problem you can't adjust the air conditioner on the Sabbath. 
A Jew cannot adjust the air conditioner on a Sabbath, but you can persuade a Gentile to do it for you. You can't bathe with a bar of soap. That's work. But you can use liquid detergent. You can use body wash because that's not as much work. You see what they're doing? You see how silly that sounds? You see what we're saying is the difference in the principle and the precept. And so as we look at the laws of God, Jesus came along and Jesus said in Mark chapter two, he said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The whole idea was that we recognize God rested on the seventh day after creation and man needs a day of rest. But look how hard they work at getting around the rule. That's not rest when you have to work twice as hard to figure out how to get by with it. It's, it's a lot harder to figure out how to get by with something, how to avoid something, than it is just to do it the right way. And, 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 and the precepts and the principles, that doesn't even get into to personal preferences, just something that, that we just do because we prefer it that way. How many churches split over preferences? Do we use the hymn book or do we use the songs on the wall? And, and all of a sudden, after time, that tradition, that personal preference, we misinterpret that as a precept. We misinterpret that as a principle. We, we misinterpret that as, as the law of God. And all of that to say, understand the times. Understand where God is moving and what God is doing. Look at everything that's going on in our culture. And look at what our society has done to remove God from our culture. And then we determine from that as the church, as a Christian, do I obey that? Do I do that? Am I honoring God by doing that? As the world is watching me, my influence, as, as the world is watching my testimony, you see, that's understanding the times. Knowing where God is moving, knowing when God is moving, and then knowing how to move forward in that. Israel, as he said, they understood the times and the second part of that was they understood what Israel should do. All of the tribes understood what was happening. This is a move of God. God is removing Saul. God is positioning David for leadership. And even though the Benjamites had been true to the house of Saul and his family, because this is the move of God, not something we may particularly like or enjoy, but this is God's move. So we're gonna get involved. We're gonna unify with the rest of them. We're gonna support it. We're gonna be involved in it. They not only understood what God was doing, but they knew what their response should be. They knew what Israel should do. They had a plan. And you and I, have to understand the times and understand what the word of God says. When the word of God says, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery. Is it preference? No. It's what God says. So in our culture, when our culture says it's just a woman's choice, it's just a matter of privacy, it, 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 it makes people happy. It, it's equality for people. What does God say about it? What does the word of God say about it? And if we want the church to remain relevant, even though it may not be socially popular, even though it may not be culturally popular, we have to stand on thus saith the word of God. Why? Because God's people are called to be people of integrity. You see, when Paul was talking about the message of the gospel, he said to some, it's a stumbling block. They don't understand it because they're not guided by God. They're not guided by the Holy Spirit. But if the word of God says it, then our presentation of the gospel has to represent what the word of God says. There has to be a consistency in it. What the word of God says. You see, we're called to be people of integrity. Integrity. 
We're called to be people of courage. You remember what these, these tribes came to do? Not just to say we're gonna have a feast and coronate David as king, but they came prepared for battle. They brought their shields, their spears, their bows, their arrows, their slingshots, whatever they were skilled in, they came prepared because they were men of courage. They had to be willing to take risks. It may not be culturally popular. It may not be the thing that's the easiest to do. You know, the only people that ever fail are the people that try to do something. The people that don't ever get involved, that don't ever do anything, they never fail. But the ones that try to do, the ones that do what God says, occasionally they'll fail. Occasionally they'll look bad, but at least they're doing what God tells them to do. We're not guided by opinion polls. We're not guided by what's popular. We're not guided by the winds that may shift and change, but thus saith the Lord. You think about the Christians throughout time. Those Christians that were relevant, those disciples of Christ, they were very relevant. They changed the world. They introduced Christianity to the world. And with the exception of one of the original 11, with the exception of John, they all died a martyr's death. It's not going to always be easy, but it is the right thing to do. God is doing something today. We're watching history play out. As you look at all scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, God said these would be the times when we see things begin to happen. We're seeing them happen. I believe with all of my heart, this is the generation that Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, this is the beginning of the desolation. And he said, you pray that it doesn't happen in the winter. You pray that it doesn't happen when the woman is nursing. You pray that it doesn't happen when she's with child. And we know that happened in Israel in AD 70 when, when Jerusalem was sacked, when the temple was destroyed. But it is also happening in our day and age. When we look at the revelation, Jesus is coming again and before he comes, he said these things are going to happen. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes in diverse places. There's going to be floods. There's going to be famines. There's going to be pestilence. Look those words up in an encyclopedia. And then look at 2020. You can just about find every one of those happening in our life. We're seeing it play out. If we want to be relevant, if the church is going to be the church, that God says they understood the times. Not only did they understand the times, they were willing to do something. They were willing to go to battle, to carry out my will, my plan, my purpose. We as the church, first of all, we have to inspect our relationship with Christ. Is that relationship everything it ought to be? First of all, have I asked him to save me, to forgive me of my sins? If I haven't, that's the first thing we've got to do to make sure that we're in the body of Christ, to make sure that we're in the family. That's not just automatic. Everybody that dies isn't just going to heaven. Only those that are grafted in, only those that are adopted in, only those that have said, I believe Jesus was who he said he was. I believe he died on Calvary, that he paid the price for my sins. I believe he didn't stay dead. I believe he rose again on the third day and he's seated at the right hand of the Father today. And if I believe that, then I confess my sins and I ask God to forgive me. And first John says, God's faithful and just and he will, he'll forgive us and we're saved and we're on our way to heaven. But before we get there, there's living to do. And the word of God tells us how. 
The word of God shows us with illustrations of God's people, some that obeyed and became relevant and impacted and influenced for positive those around them, others that didn't, that disobeyed. And we see what happens to them. And so we have to make up our minds. I'm going to be what God wants me to be. I'm going to be part of the church. I'm going to be part of the relevant church by obeying God's law, God's rule, and not coming up with some way just to get around it, just to, just to make heaven my home. But I'm going to do it, thus saith the Lord, because of what God's word says. We have an excellent opportunity next Sunday night is the church to go to the school in a time when our, our school kids, when our parents, when the staff at the school, when the teachers at the school, they don't know what they're facing. It's got to be a turbulent time. You don't know what, what the year's gonna hold, what the week's gonna hold, what the first day is gonna hold. You don't know what it's gonna look like yet. So much apprehension. What better time for God's people to be intercessors on behalf of our children, on behalf of those that teach our children, those that work with our children, to go to the school, to make our presence known, to intercede on behalf of them, to intercede with God. And yeah, it's gonna be uncomfortable out in the heat wearing a mask and staying six foot apart, but we're gonna do that because we want it to be obedient to God's word. We want it to be a, a, a responsible community neighbor. But most importantly, we wanna be interceding on behalf of our children, those that work with our children. That's one thing we can do and we will do next Sunday night. And I ask you to be a part of that. And I ask you to be looking in your community, in your neighborhood. Where can I represent Christ? Where can our church represent Jesus? How can we in these difficult, chaotic, confusing times? We can't have vacation Bible school like we did. That, that was out. But how can we help the kids that we helped before? Brainstorm, what can we do? How can we be involved in their lives, in their families? How can we still represent the church and represent Christ to those families in our community that need to see and hear the church and the word of God? And as you brainstorm and you think of that and God shows you that, bring that to the church, bring that to the leadership. As you see ways we can serve our community, let's be involved. Let's be relevant. Let's be intercessors. Examining our own relationship, being obedient to what God's word says, being that example, doing what God tells us to do, understanding the times because we are in a battle, a spiritual battle with principalities and powers in heavenly places. Joe, I'm gonna ask that you and the team come. We're gonna have a hymn of invitation. If the Holy Spirit has spoken to you this morning, something that you need to come to this altar and ask God about, I encourage you to do that during this time of invitation. Perhaps it's something that, that maybe you brought a burden in, a need in that the Holy Spirit's been dealing with you with and you wanna, you wanna come and pray about that, you wanna share that with me, you, you do that during this time. If you wanna talk to me after the service, do that. Just be obedient to what the Holy Spirit's urging you to do today. As you stand, Joe, what are we gonna be singing? Without him, I would be nothing.